the lights come back on now, if you want to turn in your chair that was quick um, so that you can see the front uh, go ahead and do so and open your Bibles uh, maybe we should have left them off just never know what's going to work on there oh well I'll talk slow um, Luke chapter 20 ah there we go there it come up Luke chapter 20 We're skipping just a little bit, and if you look back, and I'll make reference to it, one of the stories that we skip is the triumphal, injury, uh, the triumphal entry, which is a Palm Sunday, and so Palm Sunday, we'll go back and pick up that one, and then um, maybe one week after Easter, really wrap up uh, our discussion uh, on Luke, and so we are coming uh, somewhat down to an end. Wednesday is Ash uh, Wednesday, which means then it's 40 days, not counting Saturday and Sunday until Easter. And so if you're going to um, uh, abstain from anything during Lent, then it starts uh, Wednesday. And uh, we'll go on, on through Easter is late this year, which makes me think that March may have some cold weather in for us. And we may have some cold weather in April, may even have some cold weather since Easter's not until mid-April. But I'm not a weatherman, so what do I know? Storytelling. Luke chapter 20. You know, there's nothing like a good story that's told by an expert storyteller. Uh, in fact, I maintain, and I think I'm right, you don't have to agree with me, but I think I'm right on this. I, main, I maintain uh, that a good story that's orally told by a great storyteller is really more captivating uh, than reading a book or watching a movie. If you've ever been in the presence of just someone who really knows how to tell a story, all of us would agree, if you doubt that, would you just think about growing up? I think all of us would agree that there are a few things that are more captivating to our imaginations um, than a story told around a campfire, especially a scary story by someone who really knows how to tell it. And so a story around a campfire or a well-timed comedy routine, you can just get wrapped up in what that comedian is saying because he just knows how to weave a story. Or even in church sometimes, when someone just gives a captivating a testimony, uh, we become encaptured by what they're saying, and we can feel uh, the very we, the empathy that we can have for someone who just really knows how to tell a story. But in our te technologically crazed digital universe, storytelling has become a lost art. We like to watch things on the screen instead of just listen to a story. However, there is one group, maybe you've heard of this group, but there is one group that is trying to keep this storytelling art alive. In 1973, a high school journalism teacher by the name of Jimmy Smith was on his way uh, to a conference somewhere with a carload of students. And as the students were in the car, they were listening to the radio, and they heard that famous storyteller, Jerry Clower, spin a tale about coon hunting in Mississippi. And they were captivated by, here are these kids just captivated by this guy's ability to tell a story. So Mr. Smith was so inspired by what he saw and how his students reacted that he created a storytelling festival. And so now every first full weekend in October in Jonesboro, Tennessee, up in East Tennessee by Johnson City, people from all over the world gather at the International Storytelling Center for the annual International Storytelling Festival. I've seen it on TV before. I've always thought that'd be fun to go. In Jonesboro, there's a really, really neat old-fashioned candy store that I need to go to anyway, so I might as well go when the storytelling's going on. Well, Jesus was a master storyteller. In his culture, People learned mainly through oral teachings. Not a lot of people could read. And so even in the Jewish culture, they would hear the stories of the Old Testament and put them to memory. And so in a culture where oral teaching is important, the ability to tell a story was critical for effective communication. Now, Jesus' stories are called parables. And I remember in Sunday school learning a very simple definition of a parable. That a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And so Jesus' stories were meant to teach valuable lessons 
about life and eternity. There were morals to his story, in other words. Now Luke's gospel is full of Jesus' parables. And we've already looked at some of them. But now I want us to take today to take a closer look um, at one of his most poignant parables. I mean, he weaves this story and hammers the religious leaders. He kind of catches them off guard at first until he gets into the meat of the story and they start to realize that he's talking about them. And what you will see is so caught up in the story was the audience who heard this that by the end of the story, they could not contain themselves anymore and so they shout out something at the end. You know, you ever been in a movie theater when people talk back to the screen? Well, here is Jesus telling this story and people become so captured by it that they yell at the end of the story. And so captivated by the story were the religious leaders who heard it that they were ready to kill Jesus as soon as he got done telling this story because they knew the story was about them. The story is called the parable of the tenant farmers. Now remember, before we look at this story, at this point in the narrative of Luke's gospel, beginning with the triumphal entry, what we call Palm Sunday, begins in, in Luke chapter 19, verses 28 through 44. With that entrance into Jerusalem, Jesus begins the last week of his life on earth before the crucifixion. And so he tells this story knowing that he only has another couple days to live. And so he's going to say what he wants to say. Look what Luke writes in Luke chapter 19, verse 45. Luke chapter 19, verse 45. Then Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer but you have made it a den of robbers. And so every day during this last week of his life, every day Jesus was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him, yet they could not find any way to do it because all the people hung on his every word. So no doubt this entire week of Jesus' life was stressful. It was stressful for Jesus, it was stressful for his disciples, and it was even stressful for the religious leaders who about had enough of this young rabbi telling them where they could go. Later that week, during another time of Jesus teaching in the temple, and you see this in Luke 20, the first eight verses, the religious leaders questioned Jesus' authority. And so in response to them questioning his authority, Jesus begins telling them the following story. Luke chapter 20, verse 9. He says, a man planted a vineyard. Now, a good story is built on things that the audience already knows, right? You know, you got to connect to real life. And a good story is built on things that the audience are already familiar with and that they can relate to. And so Jesus' story here about this vineyard, his story is based on an extremely prophetic song found in, in the book of Isaiah known as the Song of the Vineyard. And so the people in the temple, especially the religious leaders, but all the people in the temple, as Jesus started to say, a man planted a vineyard, they would immediately know what song he's referring to. They would have that song memorized. But the problem was, this particular song in Isaiah's prophecy was a song about how God had done everything he could do for the nation of Israel, but they continually rejected him. And so it's a song of judgment. And that's the reason why at the end of the story, look what happens, verse 19 of chapter 20. 
the teachers of the law and the chief priest looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them. But they were afraid of the people. So, before we look at Jesus' story, if you would, turn to Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5. And let me read the song of the vineyard. The vineyard is Israel. I'll go ahead and tell you that up front. And so listen to the judgment that the prophet says is coming. Isaiah chapter 5 verse 1. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. And remember, the vineyard is Israel. I will take away its hedge, and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall, and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it, The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel and the man of Judah and are are the garden of its delight. And he looked for justice but saw bloodshed, for righteousness but heard cries of distress. It's a song, so it ends. Fa-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la. Now with that in mind, let's look at Jesus' story based on that song in Isaiah. Jesus says in Luke chapter 20, verse 9, a man planted a vineyard, rented it to some farmers, and went away for a long time. So like Isaiah's song in Jesus' story, the vineyard represents Israel. God is the owner of the vineyard. He is the one who planted the vineyard. And so in addition, however, Jesus mentions these farmers. And in the context, these farmers, who are later called tenants, the idea is really our idea of a sharecropper. Uh, And so these farmers or these tenants or these sharecroppers are the religious leaders of Israel. And so these farmers, what Jesus is going to say is these farmers are those people in Israel who were responsible to grow and cultivate the Israelites so that they would recognize and follow the Messiah when he comes. Jesus continues, Luke chapter 20, verse 10. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruits of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. You see, every story has a plot. And in this story, the plot is about how violently the tenant farmers treated the servants that the vineyard owner sent to collect some of the fruit of the vineyard. Now, no reason is given to us why the tenants' farmers acted the way they did. Why were they so hostile to the servants of the owner? We're not told why. The owner's request was reasonable. He wasn't asking for a portion. He wasn't asking for all of it. He just wanted a sample of the fruit that was being grown there. The plot thickens. Each time a servant is beaten and sent away empty-handed. And in this story, that happens three times. Look what happens. Verse 11. So the owner sent another servant 
but that when they also beated and treated shamefully and sent away empty-handed. He sent still a third, and they wounded him and threw him out. The idea is that each servant was treated worse than the previous servant. Now, who are these servants? Well, the servants in this story represent the Old Testament prophets. You see, in spite of Israel's continued unfaithfulness to God, God continually sent prophets to them, calling them to repentance, giving Israel another chance to be faithful. And what happened? Well, time and time again, the prophets were beaten, mistreated, and even murdered. You didn't want to be a prophet. If God called you to be a prophet, your life expectancy was not very long in the Old Testament. They were beaten, mistreated, and murdered. And get this, oftentimes it was the leaders of Israel who led the rebellion against the prophets. And so after three failed attempts, what will the owner do? He does the unthinkable. He has sent three servants. They've been mistreated. They've been beaten. They've been treated shamefully, which I think has a sexual connotation to it. And they were humiliated three times. And what's the leader going to do? He's going to send his son. Look at verse 13. Then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my son. That's a horrible idea, right? I and mean, what is the guy thinking? I will send my son whom I love. Now the way that phrase whom I love reads and in the context that we'll see later means that this was his only son. I will send my son. Perhaps they will respect him. By this time in the story, the audience is on the edge of their seats. Maybe they're starting to realize what Jesus is saying and that he's talking to the religious leaders. They can't believe that Jesus is being so bold in the temple, in front of the religious leaders, during the feast of Passover. Maybe they are feeling a little bit uncomfortable. They're sitting there or standing there listening to Jesus' words, but feeling the stone-cold stares from the religious leaders. And the audience is caught between this obvious confrontation between Jesus and the religious leaders. And so what happens to the owner's son? Well, look at verse 14. But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Now, if you're familiar with your Bible, that conversation between the servants sounds a lot like the conversation that Joseph's brothers had when Joseph came to them in Genesis chapter 37. And think about the rationale here. The thought that by killing the son, they would receive the inheritance, well, that's totally irrational. The thought that by killing the son, that they would be the next in line to receive the inheritance suggests that this was the only son of the vineyard owner. Let's kill him, then we'll be next in line. Now comes the punchline. Jesus asked in verse 15, what then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? Well, the answer is obvious to everybody. What's the owner going to do? There's no way that the owner will not will give the murdering tenant farmer his inheritance. There's no way. Instead, Jesus says in verse 16, he will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. 
Jesus' audience is now totally engulfed in the story. And they know that it's about these religious leaders. And so they sense the horror of the story. Jesus has just threatened them. And so they know exactly what Jesus is talking about. And so unable to contain their emotions, they cry out in verse 16, May this never be! In other words, Jesus, you better be quiet. <laughs> Young rabbi, you better shut up. What are you talking about? And then Jesus drives his point home in Luke chapter 20, verse 17. Jesus looked directly at them. The religious leaders, I think. And he asked, then what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. Now, a couple of days earlier, before this story, Jesus enters Jerusalem riding on a colt, right? You know the story. And as he's riding on a colt, the people shouted, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now that, that blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord is a quote of Psalm 118, verse 26. And so now Jesus quotes the exact same psalm, just a different verse. Psalm 118, 21 says, The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. And so he asked them, what does that mean? The meaning is that those who reject Jesus will be, this, will be totally destroyed on God, by God on judgment. The religious leaders completely understood that Jesus was threatening them, and so they said to themselves, we got to arrest this guy immediately. And so it won't be long now before Jesus is arrested, beaten, and crucified. Now, every good story has a twist. The twist in Jesus' story is that he took a well-known psalm about the nation of Israel as a whole, built on it and, made it, and made it a personal story about the religious leaders who have rejected him and who will reject him. It was a surprise ending for both the listeners and the, and the leaders. So now let me tell you my twist on the story by way of application. Here is my twist on the story. This parable is about you and me. We are the tenant farm. Our lives are the vineyards, and God is the one who has given us life. Did you agree with that? Who woke you up this morning? Right? If it were not for God, we would not be alive.
throughout our entire lives, God has sent his servants telling us about his son. His servants may have come in the form of a Sunday school teacher. told you the story of Jesus. His servants could have been your mother and father or a grandparent. His servants could have been a pastor or a mentor or a coach or a friend or a perfect stranger who just said the right thing at the right time. There is no doubt that many of his servants are in the pages of his word. These servants have been sent for our benefit, directing us to Jesus. Some we have accepted, but many we have mistreated and rejected. Some of you, to this day, have continued to reject God's servants, His prophets, so to speak. But it goes much deeper than that. Not only has God sent us his servants, but he has also sent us his one and only son. And more often than not, Jesus has been rejected. The story is about us. This story is a strong, strong warning. If you continue to reject Jesus, you will get what you deserve. You will be destroyed on Judgment Day, and you will have no one to blame but yourself. Because if you're sitting in this room this morning, God has sent you multiple servants and even his son. You know what you need to do and you just keep rejecting. And you show up at church every Sunday. You are a religious leader who is going to crucify Makes you feel good all over, doesn't it? Jesus is running out of time, and he's going to be dead in a couple days. He's like, I, I got nothing to lose. I'm just going to say it. I'm hoping I'm not, I'm hoping I'm not going to be dead in a couple days. I'm just telling you what Jesus said. So the only thing left from today's story is to ask two questions. Two questions. Accept God's Son, or will you crucify Him? Will you say, Bless the King who comes in the name of Jesus? Or will you be that person that's crushed by the attack of Jesus? Will you accept Him? 
say this with me. As we leave this place of worship and fellowship, let us commit ourselves to love and serve God by loving and serving our neighbors. You're dismissed.